Well, good morning, everyone. I'm showing it's 11 o'clock. We're going to get started. Um, my name is Sean Stevenson. I manage our veteran and military strategic outreach and recruiting program at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, if this is your first time with us, we are now conducting quarterly veteran showcases to help both spotlight our veterans as well as those currently serving to educate the lab on who they are, as well as the amazing work they do or continue to do while serving our nation. There will be a supporting article you can read on Newsline following the showcase. Before we get started, just a reminder to remain on mute during the interview. Feel free to leave questions or comments in the chat during the interview, and we'll be sure to get to all the questions when the interview is complete. Also, this event will be recorded. We'll be sharing a lot of pictures. We've got a great um, picture showcase that we think you're going to really enjoy. So with high participation, we ask everyone, if you're not speaking, to come off a video to save bandwidth. Thank you. With that, I am going to share my screen. So considering Memorial Day was yesterday, I'd like to emphasize the incredible sacrifice made by our men and women in uniform serving in the military who gave their lives for our country and our freedoms. Originally called Decoration Day from the early tradition of decorating graves with flowers, wreaths, and flags. Memorial Day is a day for remembrance of those serving in the military who have died in the service to our country. As we mourn their loss, may we also celebrate their unwavering spirit. As a Gold Star family member with the loss of my, bro with the loss of my brother killed in combat in the first battle of the ground war during Desert Storm, I have felt and experienced a deep sacrifice of loss for our freedom. I know Mike Skeels, our honored guest, has felt that horrible and tragic loss as well, as he personally has lost comrades in arms while he continues to serve our country. Today, we're honored to share Mike Skeels' story with you. I'd like to start by introducing our laboratory's Deputy Chief of Staff, Charles Ball who served in our country in uniform for many years as a naval officer. Charles is a strong advocate in supporting our military and veterans serving throughout the laboratory, and will be introducing us to our guest of honor, Senior Chief Mike Skeels. Over to you, Charles. Thanks, Sean, and thank you so much for everything that you do to emphasize um, the service that um, our veterans and, and our uh, reservists here at the laboratory provide. Um, I think it's re it's really important, obviously, to emphasize and honor um, the service, but I think it's also, and we're going to see this throughout the presentation here, to emphasize the extent to which the, there's mutual benefit in having um, veterans and reservists here at the laboratory in, the, in so far as there's a mutually beneficial uh, relationship that de develops between uh, the DOD and the laboratory. Um, so, uh, Mike has served 17 years in the United States Navy reserves, um, as an intelligence specialist, uh, primarily here in Northern California. In fact, I first got to know Mike when he was the special security officer uh, right here in camp parks. Um, notably, Mike has done uh, a tour in Afghanistan and a tour in Yemen. And, and of course, we will be hearing a lot more about that today. Um. Mike and his wife, Jennifer, have four children, Madison, Morgan, JJ, and Hudson. And I think it's really important to emphasize that they um, are serving as well. Uh, they endure the hardship when Mike and, and other uh, reservists are in faraway places on long deployments. Um, so thank you for your service, Jennifer. Um, at the lab, Mike is the insurance manager for DTAD and WTE. Um, he also, um, plays a really important role here at the laboratory in helping find um, outstanding and qualified veterans who can um, bring to bear their skills here at the laboratory. Um, and as we all know, we have a, a, a real um, need for uh, more qualified people uh, here at the laboratory. Um, Mike, uh, I think, exemplifies what Winston Churchill said was that the, the reservist is twice a citizen with one leg uh, in the in the military and one leg in the civilian world. Uh, again, we're going to see uh, the fruits of that here later. Just want to end here um, with a uh, a poem 
that I think uh, is inspirational uh, and very relevant here to on Memorial Day. This is a poem that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt kept in her wallet throughout World War II. It goes as follows. Dear Lord, lest I continue my complacent way, help me to remember somehow out there a man died for me today. As long as there be war, I then must ask and answer, am I worth dying for? Back to you, Sean. Thank you, Charles. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, we appreciate that. We appreciate your service and the support you provide every day for military and veterans here at the lab. Uh, with that, we're going to get started here. Uh, hi, Mike. Thank you for being our honored guest for this quarter's Veterans Showcase. We're really looking forward to to chatting with you and having having an interview and, and hearing about your experiences. Um, can you summarize what you do in your current job for us? Yes, sir. Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you very much for, for having me here. It's definitely an honor to, to be one of the many lab vets that are currently working here at the lab. Um, so pretty much uh, coming back from my deployment last year, I began a new role as the insurance manager for DTED and WTE. Um, so primarily, uh, my main job is to create these really awesome assurance manager slides where I, I pretty much just feature my two dogs. Um, but apart from that, I, I pretty much serve as kind of the, the focal point for safety and security events that happen within the DTED and, and WT program space. And then I'll filter that up through our director at AMs. So for WCI, that's uh, Marine, uh, retired Marine Corps Colonel Jeff Freeman. And then for engineering, it's a uh, prior Navy vet, Bob Dillman. So, and then I also just want to highlight too that my DTED supervisor is the uh, Army vet, Travis Paladichuk. So, I think throughout this presentation, I'm, I'm going to do my best to highlight those vets that we currently have working at the lab. That's awesome, Mike. Thank you. That sounds like both a uh, complex and challenging job to say the least. It's a uh... You know, the, the more time you and I have spent together, it's amazing to hear how many veterans you work with daily. Um, what, a, what a blessing. Hey, can you tell us about uh, your childhood a little bit, Mike, where you were raised? Tell us about your family growing up, if you would. Yeah, so I was uh, actually born at the old Santa Clara County uh, Kaiser Hospital in Santa Clara, which I, I don't think is actually there anymore, but then spent... Um, about half of my childhood living in Milpitas in a, a pretty pretty small two bedroom apartment where I shared a, a room with my two older brothers. So my mom was mostly a stay at home mom and then my dad was a, was actually a preacher and still is a, a preacher and, and has been doing that ever since he got out of the, the Navy himself um, many, many years ago. So. Uh, as far as growing up, I mean, we didn't really have a, a whole lot, but I definitely never would have loved known that. I mean, my dad really did a tremendous job of, of raising us, I think, and spending a lot of time with us. I mean, we were constantly outside playing sports, um, football, basketball, baseball, you name it, that's what we were doing. We also did a, a lot of camping, although I got to tell you, um, our camping was definitely not like what you would say as a traditional camping. It, it was usually spent at a beach somewhere near a baseball field. And then instead of a, like a traditional campfire, for some reason, we always found ourselves at a 24 hour Denny's. So uh, not sure if, if that's how I ended up becoming a, a sailor and not a Marine or Army, because I wasn't really all about that backpacking life. So, um, but really for, for me, my most influential years probably occurred when I moved to Merced um, when I was about 10. And that's when I really started to getting into uh, competitive sports, doing football and, and baseball and track. And then um, it was about that time when I was about 15, 16 year, years old that my, my first love truly came along. And that was my, my first bass guitar. And it was at that point that I knew that, you know, the only thing that I really wanted to do was, was become a rock star, marry a blonde and, and pretty much call it a day. And so turns out only one of those things ended up coming true, but that's, that's kind of the, the childhood in a in a nutshell. I uh, love it. I, you could hopefully not hear me uh, laughing a little bit about uh, some some of those things. I love it, Mike. Just great great pictures. Thank you for sharing those with us. Um, he um, especially the picture of you claiming to be Arnold in the Predator. That was awesome. I have a lot of memories of that movie to say the least. Yeah. Hey, uh, so, so Mike, tell us a little bit about your early employment years and your transition in being recruited into the military. 
Yeah, so somehow I, I made the uh, colossal mistake of convincing my dad to let me sign up for the Marine Corps when I was 17. Um, my dad did say, he, he was like, hey, the only, the only way I'm going to let you do this is if uh, the recruiters agree to let me get out of that if I picked up any sort of college scholarships. So um, ended up, got fortunate, picked up a, a few college scholarships. So after uh, wrestling around with the Marine Corps, I ended up having to get a, a letter of, uh, from the congressman to release me because, you know, Marines, once they get older, you, they, they don't let go very easily. So got out of that contract, ended up going to uh, Merced JC for, for a couple of years. The really cool thing there is because the JC was so cheap, I was actually able to use the majority of my college scholarships to buy my, my Washburn bass guitar, my 410 half stack, and uh, really ended up being college. It was just more something to do to pass the time while I you know, continued to try to be that famous rock star. So once I got done with the JC, um, still wasn't a famous rock star, unfortunately truck had just broken down so it, at that point it was like hey may, maybe this is a good opportunity to, to go ahead and, and join the navy so went to the recruiter's office um actually ended up initially signing up as a an it in, in, information tech uh tech information technician specialist uh, for six years active duty so went through maps did all that stuff the only problem was that the the actual date to leave wasn't for another six months and i was like hey i'm, I'm not I'm not cool with like waiting around. I'm trying to, to go right now. So went back to the recruiter and he was like, hey, well, I have this like this intelligence specialist thing that, that leaves like in a couple of days. And I was like, all right, awesome. Sounds great. Like, let's let's do it. So uh, by the way, what is that? And so the recruiter's like, well, it's, it's kind of like James Bond, but not really like James Bond. And like, they have all these different things. You could be like a, an intel analyst or you can be a, like an imagery analyst or, or maybe you can do some like human intelligence stuff, which is like the James Bond stuff, but not really James Bond. So I was like, all right, let's, all right that sounds good, we'll, we'll do it. Um, and then he was like, oh, but there's this other thing. So it's actually like this, this thing called a reservist. And uh, you know, at that time I was like, I have no idea what that is. So what is that? And he was like, well, so you go to your active duty boot camp, A school, and then you, you check into a reserve center and then you just do like two weeks a year, a weekend a month. And, uh, but it's, it's not a problem. It's super easy to go active duty if you want to, once you come back. So it's like, no big deal. Like we'll, we'll figure it out. And I was like, all right, cool. So let's, let's do it. So that's uh, what I ended up doing and uh, becoming a, a reservist and not really knowing what all that meant. <laughs> I love it. I love it. How many stories we have when we were young like that. That's awesome. I just love hearing it. Um, sounds like an interesting experience to say the least with your recruiters. Um, I think a lot of us had that experience for, for those of us that are um, enlisted on the line. Um, okay, so you, since you joined the reserves, tell us, Mike, about the different jobs you had while you were a reservist and also in your civilian career, um, if, if you would. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, so my my when I came back out of uh, my A school, I checked into my first like reserve unit was this compact fleet uh, ad administrative unit based out of Sacramento, and so I, I check in. But this is traditionally where like a yeoman's would go, not not an IS. So everybody there's like, I, we we have no we do like we don't even know what an IS is, let alone like what we're supposed to do with them. But he was like, but it's it's okay. We have this like upcoming um, exercise, this annual training that we're doing called terminal fury um you, you'll be perfect for it so i uh, ended up being two weeks in in hawaii which was uh, not a bad thing so and then because they had no idea what to do with me um my my whole two weeks there i ended up standing in what was called this like security watch to where every couple of days i would go in do an overnight four-hour watch and make sure like a couple of doors were locked and then that was it so the rest of the time I had completely off, I was staying out on town full per diem. So that was like really my, my intro to the Navy Reserve life, which I thought was the greatest thing ever. And it was like the smartest decision I ever made. Cause it was, I thought it was like, oh, so the Navy's just gonna be a bunch of vacations to Hawaii. Like, it sounds good. And we barely even work. So uh, once I, I got back from Hawaii, yeah, didn't, didn't have a civilian job. So I ended up getting a, a job as a, delivery driver of one of my friend's flower shops, which uh, definitely had a, a lot of interesting stories um, that I won't get into here. But this is important because this all kind of ties into um, 
how I ended up making at least one of those those dreams come true. Um, I, yeah, didn't didn't end up being a rock star, but it did end up getting that that blonde after all. So, um, working at the as a delivery driver, and decided like, hey, this is a great opportunity to to try to start playing music again. So, and get got onto uh, the MySpace. If anybody remembers the old old MySpace back in the day, you know now we have Facebook, but MySpace was like the the OG of social media platforms. So um, found this solo artist named John Valenti. He was doing guitar and, and singing kind of on his own. And so I messaged him, I was like, hey man, like I really like your music, like this sounds great. Like you ever thought about doing a, a full band? And he was like, oh, hey, actually, yeah, but that's exactly what we're, we're wanting to do. So he invited me out to a, a show at the Modesto Sports Bar. Ended up going out there, um, got to know his other buddy who was a drummer named Marcus Sperry. Um, needless to say, kicked it off. Everything was cool. So at this point, I had uh, transferred my reserve unit to the Compact Fleet Intel Reserve Unit that was drilling out of uh, Camp Park. And so one Saturday after drill, drove out to uh, San Francisco to meet up with John and Marcus as they were doing a show. I was wearing my my old Johnny Cash uniform, which was the, the old uh, Navy working blues. Um, showed up. Everything was good, and then that, that's when I saw um, what I thought, you know, at the time was, was one of the most beautiful women girls that, that I had ever seen, um, which is funny because she wasn't actually blonde at the time. She was she had dyed her, her hair, but um, the funny thing there is when she saw me, she, she thought I was about the weirdest person she's ever seen showing up in this, like, all-black uniform, like, you know, kid looks like I'm 12 wearing, wearing a uniform. So... Uh, that didn't necessarily go over too well, but luckily we ended up playing a, a show at the Modesto Sports Bar. She she ended up going to that one, and then we met up again at the Gordon Bierski in San Jose, and that's that's when I actually got her number. And then, you know, 14 years of marriage later, 16 years being together, four kids, uh, here here we are today. So, um, but anyway, enough about that. So talk about my my real job first real job um out of you know college or, or out of the military so john valenti's wife leah valenti and then marcus both worked at the stanislaus county probation department as probation officers and it was uh, talking with them and, and getting some really good guidance and mentorship that i ended up actually applying and becoming a probation corrections officer at the juvenile hall so i did that for about you know four four years give or take um, but then if we, you know, fast forward to late 2008, early 2009, uh, it's, that's really where a lot of the, the major life uh, events that happened. So uh, late 2008, ended up proposing to, to Jen. She said yes. That was, that was good. First good sign. And then um, early 2009, got mobilization orders to Afghanistan. Pretty much a few weeks later, found out she's pregnant. And so we decided to have a kind of a small wedding in, in Castroville at one of her family's beach houses there. So on April 24, 2009, my dad performed our wedding and, and we got married. And then a few weeks later, um, May 8th, checked into Nosca Alameda to, to start the orders. Um, so didn't initially deploy out to Afghanistan immediately. There's, as Sean and, and Charles know, there's a ton of, of work up that typically ends up happening with, with these deployments. So uh, for this particular one, checked into to San Diego for a few weeks for the active duty in processing, then went on to four weeks of Army combat training, and then in uh, South Carolina, then went to eight, eight weeks of the Joint Interrogation Certification course in Fort Huachuca, Arizona, and then four weeks of the Joint Special Operations Command Sensitive Exploitation course, and then finally, Around October time frame, uh, made it to Afghanistan where I was assigned as an interrogator with the Joint Special Operations Task Force stationed at Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, back home, you know, my, my, my brand new wife is entering her third trimester to get ready to, to give birth to our first daughter. So, um, let's take a I had to take a break with the uh, America's Cup Dallas Cowboys. So 
Um, I, as mentioned, I was an interrogator, so th this was easily the, the best job I've ever had in, in the military. So, I mean, it was pretty straightforward. I was with the Special Operations Task Force, so um, teams would go out just about every night on objective, bring bring uh, some, some people of interest back, and then it would be my job to interrogate and try to get more information to feed that back out to the teams so they could go out and on to the, the next target. Um, just to kind of maybe put this one into perspective. So I'm a, a, a brand new E5, barely three years into the military, um, recently turned 24, have a, a brand new wife at home, she's about to give birth, and then I'm literally supporting the, the global war on terrorism at, at the tip of the spear. So definitely made for some, some pretty interesting and, and memorable stories. Um, but speaking of that, so I'd, I'd say probably the, the most memorable story probably be, uh, came on December 16, 2009. So I'm doing my, my regular uh, night shift as an interrogator. Um, meanwhile, back home, Jen is, is getting induced to go into labor. Um, unfortunately, the, the labor didn't necessarily go as planned. So she ended up being in, in labor for close to 23 hours before the doctors decided to do an emergency C-section and so I'm in Afghanistan interrogating detainees, kind of you know, trying to take breaks as I can to, to call home to get updates. So um, there is this one particular detainee that I had the, the, the extreme privilege of talking to that night. So we were having a, a pretty interesting conversation or argument, and um, it wasn't about anything that was of importance. Um, so we were literally arguing about the size of the moon. So um, a little, little backstory here on interrogation. So I know a lot of people have seen like Zero Dark Thirty and, and all these like crazy movies where they, they show these like pretty intense interrogations. That That's definitely not the normal. So typically an interrogation is, is all about building rapport, relationships, and, and it's like super boring. That You might spend 12 hours a day for like weeks just literally having meals with people and getting to know them because it's all about building that that relationship to then try to get into to some actual um, information so part of that i would show like national geographic videos and stuff of the world because a lot of these detainees that i would talk to had never traveled outside their their village before so it would just like absolutely blow their mind um, so back to how we got to the moon argument was I had I was showing a, a video of space and all this stuff, and and so he was like, "Oh, this is all lies! Like, there's no way, there's n there's no way the moon is is that big." And so I was like, "All right, hold, well, hold on, let's let's take a little bit of break." So he gave me an opportunity to to call back home to see how Jen's doing with, with the C-section. Um, so no updates. So I was like, "All right, so I guess I'll go back and talk to the moon denier." And um, so. You know, go go back and forth, and and as he's like, no, like the the, the moon is that big, and, and so finally, he's like, well, okay, ha, like, can you at least prove to me how how you come to this conclusion that the moon is not big? And he's like, yeah, like easy. So if you look up at the sky, I was like, all right, we we weren't outside, but I'll 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 play with him here. So I was like, so look up at the sky, and then if if you reach your hand up, and you can almost grab the moon like it's the size of a pebble. I was like, oh, okay, this, this makes sense. He's like, so see, when you grab the moon like it's the size of a pebble, that means it's the size of a pebble. And so there's no way that we could be, that the moon is bigger than us because the moon is literally the size of a pebble. So I was like, okay. Um, I mean, that, that that makes sense. So uh, let me go, let me, let me take another break here. So go back. Uh, tell the, my analyst this, this story, and they're all, of course, like making fun of me because I somehow get stuck with this guy. So also took that as another opportunity to see how my wife's doing. And then, you know, at, at that point, I find out I'm, I'm now a father of a healthy nine pound, five ounce, uh, 22 and a half inch daughter, a baby girl. And so, you know, Jen's good recovering. And uh, so kind of a, a short lived celebration there. And, and it's like, all right, good. Um, well, I guess now I'll go back to having this conversation with the uh, the moon denier, which ended up working out pretty good because I will say this, that so I did go back in there and I 
I let him know, like, like honestly, like he just blew my mind. Like, that you're you're actually right. Like, what you're saying is right, and and I'm I now believe that the moon is is actually this small because that cause at the end of the day, it's it, you know we you build that relationship and you kind of play along, and and now he becomes the teacher, and I'm I'm the the mentee, which leads into hopefully teaching me about like some information that maybe that you know kind of trying to get. Um, so that was that was definitely probably the most uh, memorable story. Um, how, so I do want to, you know, unfortunately talk about a, a, with Memorial Day just yesterday, and you know, kind of out of respect for those that that did give the ultimate sacrifice. So um, some of the hardest parts of the deployment was was definitely, you know, in the, the nine months that I was there, we we had over 27 within the command that were killed in action, and so. That's definitely um, the toughest part of that deployment was attending what, what's known as the, the last roll call for those that are fallen. So this is where you would have displays that are set up. Um, for ours, it was pretty simple. It, it was a helmet, a rifle, and, and a boot. And, and um, then you would typically have like somebody like the first sergeant would start calling the roll call for a group. And so the first couple of names that they call are those that are in attendance. And so they would roger up and announce here. Um, and then when they get to those that were the name of the fallen, they would go silent and then the name would be called again. You know, still no answer. And then um, finally a third time, that's when the first sergeant would announce that, you know, the fallen was killed in action. And so for, for me, I mean, that, that was the hardest part. You know, it, it was a reminder of, of how brave these men and women are to to really to have given the ultimate sacrifice for for what we all believe in uh, what we're doing. And then, so uh, I would say the the third and final highlight of the deployment was definitely coming back home. Um, it was the easily the the happiest part of that. Um, Really, the, the kind of the, the first opportunity to, to meet my daughter, um, to get to know her, and to, to really build build a family. You know, go to Disneyland because that seems to be all that we do. Um, but and then, so after the deployment, I took a, a set of active duty orders to U.S. Cybercom J225, which was based out of Camp Park, and um, this this was a tremendous opportunity. I mean, this is where I I really got to meet and serve with some incredible vets that currently work here at the lab, um, like Colonel Pam Mori, Commander Michael Rodriguez, um, as Commander Charles Ball mentioned earlier, Staff Sergeant Dave Kirkpatrick, uh, Staff Sergeant Ryan Hakes, and then IS-1 Alexander Duarte, and um, others like Sergeant Adam Morgan and um, Captain James Jones were, were ones that I didn't necessarily serve with, but I know that they had they were over there at Camp Parks as well. And um, it was here where I really got to learn more like about SCIF management that led to a ton of different security roles that ultimately led me to the lab in 2017 where I served as the director of security officer and security manager, um, working for what I consider to be easily the best boss I've ever had, and, and that's Roger Rocha. And then uh, fast forward to September 2021 to April 2022, that was where I was my last deployment out in Yemen. And in this role, I served as the J2 Senior Enlisted Advisor and also as the, the what was called the FMV PED, which is the Full Motion Video Processing Exploitation and Dissemination Analyst, and then also a Human Debriefer. Um, so that was a, a very interesting deployment because, you know, depending on how you look at it, there really was not a whole lot of, of activity going on in, in terms of mission. But, it, you know, we were, we were definitely able to, to keep ourselves busy with, with you know, extracurricular activities, made, you know, whether it was trying to get warfare pins, completing college work. Um, we actually had some really nice beaches that, that were there. Or um, I think one of the pictures prior was was having some good good fun with the with our working dog and putting some antlers on them for our uh, our Christmas our deployed Christmas that is. But that is, yeah, in a kind of a, a long story there, but with with a, a couple of different um, highlights. But that's to answer your question there, Sean. 
Yeah, Mike, let me uh, share a few more pictures with everybody as we catch up as you were telling your story. I apologize. I just want to give give everybody a chance to see some, some of these. And if if you want to speak to them, Mike, please, please do. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, so this was when I talked about the FMV. So this is our, one of our, our drones that we had out there, our UAVs that would collect the, the video that um, my responsibility would be to, to then watch the live feed and, and kind of analyze it and as we, we would go and then uh, turn that in afterwards to a post-mission product. This was us setting up some of those equipment that was used to support those, um, those missions and, and those flights. And uh, so some of the, the stuff we, we did was setting up a, a little campfire, a little, little place to kind of chill out and relax. And then um, this was one of the, the many scorpions that we would uh, come across. We actually, so funny here is we were warned when, before we left, it was like, hey, you guys are going to get overrun by scorpions. There's like cobras everywhere. I mean, there's like these man-eating creatures and all this stuff. And the entire time I was there, um, thankfully, I didn't see one wild scorpion or cobra or anything like that. Like we, others would find them. Um, it's probably like our closet marines that were finding them and then catching them and keeping them as pets. But that's uh, it worked out because that was like the last thing I wanted to see. And then um, obviously, the, the the best part is is the the come home trip. So. Wow, thank you, Mike. Uh, pr appreciate it. Thank you for taking on us um, on your journey as you served. It was, uh, it's, again, just to, as friends and as colleagues to hear, hear it again is uh, just so many, um, lots of challenges, experience to say the least, that are truly memorable. Um, I want you to know, the lab wants you to know, your values, your principles are deeply appreciated, Mike, in both serving our nation and your family. Um, no easy task to manage. I. I know firsthand, as you know, I had to go through some some of the same. So, um, so much respect and appreciation for you and your family, buddy. Um, Mike, if you Thank would, you. You, of, of course, share share with us a little bit about uh, your family history in the in the military. Yeah, so this was uh, well, kind of a cool little uh, like family research project. I you know going through this, I didn't realize how many have have actually served. So, uh, my dad first enlisted in the Navy in in 1973. He began as an undesignated seaman on the USS Little Rock, which would eventually become the flagship for the Sixth Fleet, and then that, that was home ported out in uh, the Med. So he he was uh, while he was undesignated, he he got an interest to strike, excuse me, as a for a dental tech. So he did that for six months, and then got approved for that rating and went to San Diego to the to the dental. Tech um, A school, which by the way, the dental tech is no longer an actual rate anymore. Everything got rolled up into HMs and the corpsmen. But so we did that, and then his his first official duty station as a dental tech was to the Washington Naval Yard, and uh, that's where he would meet a woman named Debbie Peterson. And almost 40 years later, they are still married. So <laughs> that's kind of kind of cool. And then he got out to become a, a full time preacher. So. Uh, talk about Debbie, which is my mom. She enlisted in the Navy in 1974. Um, she went right into dental tech A school out of boot camp. And then after that, she was stationed out in Guam. And she would support Operation New Life, which was the care and processing of the Vietnam refugees that were evacuated during the fall of Saigon. Um, she would then volunteer to, to help set up and, and work in a dental facility at Oroti Point. Sure, I said that wrong. And then afterwards at Camp Asan. So, and then once she was done with Guam, she went to the, uh, her next duty assignment was at that Washington Naval Yard where she obviously met my dad. And then she finished out her enlistment and was honorably discharged in 1978. Um, so, uh, what's, what's pretty cool here is both my parents' grandfathers also served. So unfortunately, not a whole lot is known about my, my dad's father's service, um, other than that his name is Glenn. And he was in the Navy and served aboard a barge. And then uh, my mom's dad, Harold Peterson, actually enlisted in the Army in 1942 after the attack on Pearl Harbor. So he was a technician fifth grade or T5, which is a, a rank that's no longer in service and he actually 
So we drove a tank and actually served under General George Patton in North Africa and Europe. And then he was the recipient of five bronze stars among other service medals. And then he was honorably discharged in 1945. Um, kind of a funny story about that. So my mom actually didn't, had no idea that her dad served under um, General George Patton. It wasn't until around 1970 when the, the movie General Patton came out and my mom was talking to her dad and she's like, hey, we should we should go see that movie. And he, her dad responded, he was like, like Patton, was like, why do I need to see a movie about Patton? I served under him in North Africa. And you know, my mom's like, oh, that's, that's interesting. I'm surprised I never knew that. So, and then uh, my oldest brother, Jeff, actually served in the the military in the Navy for 10 years as a fleet Marine Corps medic. So there you go, Sean. See, so some of us support the Marine Corps. So, um, and the cool thing there is that he was actually stationed in Guam. So he kind of got to share that, that history with, with my mom. And then um, I do also want to highlight my wife's parents as, as well. So her grandfather, or both her grandfathers served in the army. And then her dad, Bob Allen, spent 20 plus years as a CHP officer. Um, unfortunately, before he was medically re retired from a, a pretty bad accident while he was on patrol. So, you know, both of our families have a, a very proud tradition of service to, to both our nation and, and our local communities. Mike, thank you uh, for sharing that rich family uh, history of service in in a uniform. Um, thank you to the Skeels family, the Allen family, the Peterson family, all of you uh, for your contribution and your service to the nation. We are um, we are as proud, I think, as Mike is. Um, so, so Mike, tell us a little bit more. How much longer do you plan to serve in the military reserves, and in what uh, capacity would would that be? Yeah. So, uh, I would say that depends on the the day that you ask on um, how much longer I'll serve, <laughs> but. Um, so I, I have 17 years of, of total service, 14 years toward retirement. So I definitely think I have at least six more to go to, to hit that, that 20 years. But um, I'm up for, for Master Chief next year, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. But I've, I've definitely been thinking a lot about putting in an, an officer package. Um, surprisingly, not Intel. I've, I've actually really been considering going for a human resource officer. I mean, that's kind of my background with having an MBA and, and an HR management, and then also starting to study up for the PHR certification as well. I just, for some reason, I've, I've always enjoyed the, the HR career field, and um, I think that would be pretty cool to, to be able to do that in the, in the Navy as well. Mike, I like it. I could see you picking up uh, Master Chief, that's for sure, or uh, crossing over to the dark side, onto the officer side. Yeah. But, uh, I remember I remember when I was enlisted before I came became an officer as well. So may may end up sharing some of that uh, same experience with you in the future. Um, hey, so, so Mike, share a little bit of the you know when you think about your transitions from military service, you know they can be really challenging, right? Um, tell us about your transition from military deployments to working at the lab. Yeah, so um, I, I I will say this this last one. Um, I mean I'm not gonna you know uh, uh, skirt around the issue I mean it, it sucked it, it 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 really sucked I mean it was it was hard leaving leaving the wife and four kids I mean I remember um kind of you know saying goodbyes and as I'm I'm driving away from the house and I, I see in the rearview mirror my three-year-old you know running after me it's like that was a that was not an easy thing to do to to leave them but um, from from the lab standpoint, I mean, so I unfortunately I had just taken a position as the configuration management manager for NMTP, working for Kerry Cadwall, who um, retired last year. Awesome boss, and then John Dillon took over for for her, who also just an incredible supervisor. Um, but due to the deployment, you know the the lab needed to, to fill that role. 100% understandable, like I I get it, like completely understand that. Uh, the cool thing though was that like, I kept it, Carrie really made a point to keeping communication with me throughout the deployment to keep me updated. And so she made sure that I had a, a spot to go to. So 
which um, maintained my, my classification and, and pay and all that stuff. So she found me a, a home in quality assurance. And really, to, to be completely honest, the best part about that was, was getting introduced to uh, Todd Grinsteiner, who's also a Navy vet, Lieutenant Commander, retired. Just a phenomenal person. I mean, Todd was, I, I think I learned maybe more from him than, than throughout my entire time at the, at the lab and in, in quality assurance, which is like not the coolest thing in the world. I mean, it's like a lot of different regulations. Some things really don't, don't seem to make a whole lot of sense, but but Todd, he, he was an amazing teacher and, and I still keep in, in communication with him um, today, even in, in my new position. So, you know, while losing my old job, you know, definitely kind of sucked. It it was really cool to know, um, especially with Terry continually reaching out to me that like, you know, while the lab technically had to keep my position, they, at no point did it ever feel like they were doing it because they had to. It, it felt like they were doing it because that they, they wanted to and they kept in contact with me. So um, from, from that standpoint, the transition back and, and being away, it, it was an incredible experience. Yeah, Mike, as long as we've known each other, um, I've heard you tell me that story, you know, different ways at different times. And it's just, um, it's an amazing, it's an amazing transition, an amazing story. And uh, to see the lab, um, how committed we all are to each other and ensuring that you had that position when you came back, the last thing you needed to worry about is coming back to this lab and continuing to do the important work here. Just uh, between Carrie and everybody you mentioned, it's just a, um, it's a testament of who you are and who we are. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Mike, everyone is always kind of curious about military highlights. What's what's been a highlight of your military career to this point? Yeah, uh, for, like to be completely honest, for me, it's, it's it starts with my family. Um, I mean, I got married while while serving. My first daughter was was born while I was in Afghanistan. I had two more kids while I was on active duty orders. Um, my third or our fourth kid actually came. Um, while I was here at the lab, which, you know, could side story on that one. So Christine Via and Christine Kerr um, put put on a, a really cool event for my wife and I. It was like kind of a little baby shower and, and like didn't ask for it. So they, they just wanted to do it for us, which which I thought was like super cool. Um, you know, another highlight was, was making Chief, you know, being accepted into the Chief's Mess in 2013. For the, for the Navy and, and Sean I know, and, and Charles know this, like there's for enlisted, there's there's no higher pinnacle in, in your career than, than making chiefs and being accepted into the mess. Um, but really, once you get past that, it, you find out that even even better than that is getting others to get selected for chief. And, and I think that was um, for me, <clears throat> and a super awesome experience. I had a Sam Turner shown on the screen here. So Sam and I were deployed together. He was a, a first class and we uh, just a phenomenal person and came back from that deployment and he picked up Chief on his first look. So I mean, that, that was a pretty cool experience. And then finally two, two dates that ring in mind, June 17th, 2010 and April 8th, 2022. And those were the two times that I stepped back on American soil from, from being deployed. I mean, there's, there's no, greater feeling than getting back to, to America, that, that's for sure. Yeah, Mike, it's it, it's humbling to listen to you and, and share some of your highlights um, about your family. I know I respect that as a husband and as, and as a father. Um, you saw some amazing places during your time in the Navy, um, that's for sure. Mike, share, share with us a little bit how the military impacted you as a person, how how your military experience help you, helps you in your role here at the laboratory. Yeah, for for me, it, I think it's it's really helped me be more of an empathetic um, person, and I think it's given me a lot of great lessons on leadership. You know, for it, I I really think like being a great leader really starts with being a great listener and a great follower. And and for the military side of the house, like you really have to be willing to to trust your people to to be able to do the jobs that they're they're there to do you know and to not get into into their way to do it and to really be that person that allows them to to do their job um you know especially like as we get closer to our pa season i mean it's like it's it's really all about like taking care of your people um and just 
by doing the right thing and, and everything else kind of tends to fall in place with, with that. Mike, again, it's a uh, it's a very um, humbling message to hear from you. Um, we all face a lot of adversity throughout our personal and professional work life. Um, tell us a little bit about the adversity you faced in your military career at the lab or just in life in general. So I I, I face adversity every day because I have four kids. So <laughs> that is what it is. <laughs> But um, no, I, I, so this this one may sound a little a little weird, but for me, I mean, so I, I've been blessed with with looking like I'm 12. So, um, but with that, it's like I've whether it was being a corrections officer at a juvenile hall, or you know, trying to be an interrogator, or even making chief um, when I was 27, it 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 was always like, hey, like, how is anybody ever going to take you serious? You know, when you look like you're 12 and you kind of sound like you squalled and, and you know all this all this crazy stuff and i was like for, for me it was like it you know none of that really matters like at, at the end of the day it's like it, i'm going to give people the respect that they deserve you know in turn i expect that back and you know at the end of the day you're not going to necessarily win everybody over but that shouldn't necessarily affect how you treat them and so um that's it's just kind of always been that way and it's it's all good it's uh you know, I hopefully when I, I'll, I'll look like you and, and Charles when I when I when I get to that age, so, as, as both of you look very young. So. Hopefully, a lot better looking though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I second that. Hey, Mike, um, great perspective. Totally, just respect and love your 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 honesty. Just one of the things Charles and I and all your colleagues and friends here really appreciate you. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Mike, often veterans are curious, right? What, why LLNL could be a potential fit for them to work? Why work at the laboratory? So why is the lab a good place for veterans in your opinion? Yeah, so I so, so I actually just uh, had a, a recent story on this one. So went out to Idaho for an explosives course. Um, unfortunately, on my way out there, I picked up some really bad bug. Um, was sick for for about 24 hours straight, um, but but the one the person that that put this course on Mark Hart um, kept in comms with him the whole time. So like super understanding, super nice about, about the whole situation. I mean he just he went out of his way to ensure that like I was good, I was taken care of. I mean he he went to to Walmart and got chicken noodle soup, Gatorade, um, ginger ale. Like even even like an actual bowl, so I could use it to to put it in the microwave. Refused to let me pay him back, and I mean I th I think like that right there just shows like the type of people that we have at at the lab, and you know it's like that camaraderie that you're used to seeing in the military. That I like I don't know if you're gonna find that at you know too many other civilian organizations like like you do here at the lab, and it and it, and it wasn't just Mark. I mean it was. Paul Chow, my, my supervisor, Travis Palagichuk, even Kathleen Noonan from Health Services reached out to me. I mean, it was just like, that's just something that you expect to see in the military, not not necessarily at a civilian organization. And, you know, put all that aside, that's not even counting. I mean, we, we do have tremendous pay and benefits here as well. So, I mean, I think if you put all of that into perspective, I mean, this is just a tremendous place for vets. Mike, what a great story. Again, uh, hearing it before and just kind of hearing you say it again, it's just so, you know, I guess I'll say for the midshipmen and cadets that are on the call right now that are coming into the laboratory and, you know, to hear these stories and to hear how genuine and how sincere they are, like the one Mike just shared. Um, thank you for sharing that, Mike. Really, it, it does feel like family and we appreciate you, brother, and everybody who uh, who helped you. Um, so, Mike, we all have mentors, family, and friends who helped us along our path. Share with us who was most influential for you during your journey. Yeah, I mean, for for me, it's it's my wife. I mean, number number one, and she's she's kind of the the reason behind what I do, uh, how I'm able to do it. I mean, she's been with me pretty much my entire naval career. So, um, without her, none of this is possible. Um, you should picture James Jones there. I mean, James. So James, I met him before I came to the lab because he found out about me trying to get into the lab. 
he, James went out of his way to go to Camp Parks to meet with me to, to kind of coach me up on the whole process, to help me with the interview, um, led me along the way. And then, and ever since then, I, I mean, pretty much all of my successes here at the lab, I can attribute back to James and, and his guidance and mentorship. I mean, just both on the military side and the civilian side, I mean, he, he's been tremendous. Well, also, uh, I was super fortunate into going right into working for Roger Rocha. I mean, Roger just, like, when I think of a civilian leader at an organization, like, the first, Roger's the first one that comes to mind. I mean, just allowed me to kind of ex explore the, the career field, really get into things that I was interested in, and he he just, like, anybody that ever worked for Roger knew him just knew that, like, super genuine, really had everybody's back and was going to do whatever he, he could to, to help people out. Um, so many other different people. I mean, Sean, you're, you're one of them as, as well. You know, just being able to be there to help guide me, allowing me to, to get into the, the military and veteran outreach program. I mean, this incredible program that, that you've built. Um, others like Commander Charles Ball as well, meeting him at, at Camp Parks. Um, I do have a list of, of people that uh, I, did, I wanted to, to name. I mean, there's the Army vet Steve Kahn, Army vet Anthony Regalado, Army Colonel Brian Cracciola, Army vet Scott Colonies, retired Marine Corps Colonel Jeff Freeman, Christine Kerr, Dave Johnstone, retired Navy Commander Mike Rodriguez, Kim Halleck, Jason Marty, Richard Ward, Don Duranco, Christine Villa, Navy vet Kim Rouser, Monique McAllister, and uh, Navy vet Chief Dave Masoni. I mean, those just some of the, the many, right, that have really been instrumental throughout my time here at the lab. Yeah, Mike, it's, um, thank you. It's amazing to listen to you talk about the people you mentioned, the impact they have on your life, and especially when a lot of us, you know, have worked together and just see um, how influential they were for, they were for you. It's, that's amazing. And to hear you mention your wife first, um, it just really speaks to, to who you are and what you stand for. Um, so, Mike, um, Link, I think I believe this is our final question. Um, where else? Uh, tell us a little bit, excuse me, about your interests and hobbies outside of work. What do you like to do in your spare time? So, I, I mean, it used to be playing bass, but that kind of got put on on hold since the, the, the first one came. But uh, I will say this, so Colonel Jeff Freeman, the amazing drummer, we're, we're trying to start a band here at the lab. So if anybody knows how to sing or play guitar, Hit us up because we're, we're down. Um, but other than that, it, it's it's really all about uh, family. So I love watching the kids play play their sports. My my oldest daughter, Madison's kind of getting into to volleyball. JJ been doing uh, flag football. My the other daughter, Morgan, has been playing competitive soccer for the last couple of years. And then um, my youngest one just likes to destroy stuff and say a lot of inappropriate things that my wife gets mad about and I just laugh and it's probably not a, a good thing for a, a dad to do, but it's, it's pretty funny. And then love love watching football. Um, so I love America, which means I obviously love America's team, the Dallas Cowboys. So, and then other than that, I mean, we, we try to go to Disneyland whenever we can, but it's been a little bit harder because we have like 47 kids. So um, that, that's, that's pretty much it. So. Uh, uh, Mike, it's um, actually, let's give, let's give a one, one, one more question for you. Um, so before we close, what's next for you? Uh, in, a, in a perfect world, I would say chicken fried rice at Tintai. Would, would definitely be next right now. Um, but for like lab military career, um, it's honestly, it's continuing with, with DTED and, and WT and the assurance manager role, you know, obviously continuing to, to work with you and, and supporting the military and veteran outreach program. I mean, I, I think like in a perfect world, if, if I could do that full time, I mean, that, that, would, that would be it. And con continuing to, to support our vets and trying to grow the, the program, but um, that's, you know, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm here for America. Make make her proud. Love it. Love it, Mike. Mike, um, just in, in saying a few things as we close, we love working with you. We appreciate all the time you give to our program, the military veterans. 
you're always the first person I call on when helping me place veterans. You've been phenomenal. Um, so I want to thank you for that and taking the time to interview with us. You've been sick. You've been out. Um, you put this together. You and I work in together. Um, and it's just, um, we're just so fortunate to have you. So I want to pass it over to Charles very quickly. Um, Charles, any, any final words that you'd like to share? Thanks, Sean, Mike. Great job. I really appreciated your sharing the story and learned a lot. Um, and I just want to emphasize, I, it, it would be important for everyone not to just remember, uh, the fall on Memorial day, but, uh, a little bit more often during the year back to you, Sean. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate that. Um, Kimberly, were there any questions in the chat for uh, Mike or myself? Um, yeah, we did have one final question. Um, what advice would you have for transitioning service members who would want to join LLNL? Go ahead, Mike. Do you want that? Okay. Yeah, so um, re reach out and uh, you know, Sean is a tremendous resource as far as like resume building, cover letter, kind of helping to, to translate that military lingo to civilian speak. Um, he created a, a super great website that, that has a lot of that stuff on there. But um, yeah, I would say reach out and uh, apply often. I mean, I, I think there's this like misconception that like, oh, well, you know, if I apply to like, you know, more than one job, everybody's going to think I'm desperate and all this stuff. And it's like, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I've never really understood that. Like you should be applying for everything that you believe that you fit and that you're interested in and, and that you're qualified for. And then see see what happens from there. Yeah, and I would I would just I would agree with a lot of what Mike said. We have um thanks to Charles and some really strong leaders at this laboratory, we care deeply about our military and veterans and we have made a real investment. We have a lot of skin in the game. We are the thoroughbred in the race across the complex right now for, for bringing in military and veterans. And um, right now we have 573 veterans reported. It's something we are extremely proud of. And in the entire pipeline of military and veterans from students to transition, to active duty to reservists like Mike, that whole pipeline of the of the act, those that are here too as well, we're almost at 700. So we we care deeply. We're making great progress. And um, reach out to me. Um, so in closing, we've just got a couple minutes left. I'd like to thank uh, Mike again for working with our team, and Mike sharing your story. I'd like to thank you for your service, your commitment to our nation, your family sacrifice, um, all of the family members and friends that are on the line, it takes all of us and it takes all of you. And because of you, um, you have to help Mike become who he truly is. Um, and Mike, I'd like to thank you for being a, a great colleague and a great fan, uh, friend. I'd like to thank Charles, um, my great colleague and friend for sponsoring this event for us. And I'd finally like to thank our internal team, um, Katie Pagney and Kimberly Moore. Without both of you guys, this just does not happen. So thank you so much. And with that, uh, everybody have a great afternoon and have a great lunch. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, thank you.